Welcome to the garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. This project, if you've been following along with it, we're about three years into it. Some of the plants that we're gonna show you in an extended tour video here have been in that long, and other things have been in for you know less than a year. We're gonna go through every plant in this garden over a multi-part uh, video series. We normally do tours, we just bounce around and show you what's kind of blooming at that moment. This tour is more about diving in, see how something has responded, you know, you know, how long it's been in the ground, how it's growing, you know, what we expected from it and what we've actually gotten out of it. And so that's, that's where we're going to go. We're going to start on what is the south side of the property in the back garden. So it's kind of the, the north, uh, the, the south, what is it? Southwest side of the house. <laughs> that's the kind of, the southwest corner. That's where we're starting off here. Uh, most of the plants that we're going to initially talk about here are mostly screening plants. They're meant, this is, we have a fairly close neighbor uh, back here behind us who we get along with perfectly fine, but we don't want to stare at them every time they walk out. And they don't want to stare at us every time we walk out. So we've built a bit of a wall here. Uh, the rest of the garden, you'll notice we really haven't put any larger screening material in because we just don't have to. We don't have any other angles uh, into houses. The only thing we're going to skip uh, in this tour will be a few of the containers. Uh, we, we did these containers and videos just a couple, maybe two, three weeks ago. And so if you want to go back and look at the, uh, the containers, if, it's a con if there, are, there are probably a couple containers here that weren't in those videos, and we'll show you what's in those. But you can go back and watch those. Some of the containers are in weird spots. That's because we're in the process of constructing a patio uh, right here in front of the camera. And those, those stone, none of those stones have been set yet. And uh, so underway with that process, and these containers are going to end up on there. So let's jump right in and show you some plants. So again, this is the southwest corner of the lot. Uh, one of the projects that we haven't finished yet is a greenhouse that was, this was just a metal framed building. I took off the skin off of it very early on in this project, put a screen, put a shade cloth over the top of it. The lumber that's laying down here is going to be part of this project. I haven't gotten to that. So that, that, project, that project is coming up at some point. The first plant in the line of screening plants, and these last three here are the newest planted ones, so they're smaller than some of the other things that I was just standing in front of. This plant right here I think is going to end up being wildly popular. This is a Screenplay Holly, which has the absolute perfect name. It's a hybrid of two hollies, Ilex Integra and uh, Ilex Latifolia. Very fast growing upright holly, beautiful dark green foliage. We're just looking at it. It's got a little honeydew on it. There must be some aphids up in the oak above it. But this plant has grown just this season. We're here at the beginning of June. All of that green stem, you know, is new growth this year. So we've already seen, uh, in some cases, as much as a foot of growth in a very cool spring on this plant. I think by the time it really ramps up its engine, it's going to be growing two, three feet a year. Uh, very heavy fruiting. Uh, variety as well. So again, I think screenplay might be limited availability at this point, but once it is available, I think literally it's just going to be everywhere. It's a perfect, very fast growing upright evergreen. Next up is this Miss Scarlet Elysium. This is an interesting Elysium. It wears its flowers on the outside. It's a red flowering Elysium and you know where a lot of our Elysiums will just kind of eat their flowers. They'll be down in the middle of it. This one wears them on the outside. Uh, really, a uh, really great plant. Got neighbor's puppy uh, visiting over here. Uh, but again, this one was, again, selected for that reason. Also, look how compact this is. We haven't laid a blade on this since day one. I'll give you some attention. Here you go. We haven't laid a blade on it since day one. It's just a perfect low doming mound. It'll ultimately probably reach 10 or 15 feet tall if we let it. But again, I don't think we'll ever have to lay a blade on it uh, while it does that. The uh, Japanese maple directly in front of the camera is called Hot Blonde. This one came from Mr. Maple uh, up in the mountains. It needs a stake. You see it's leaning off to the side. I just haven't had a chance to uh, stake it yet. It's grown a lot. This is a very fast growing Japanese maple. And when it went in the ground, it was maybe like this last year, right? I mean, it's doubled in height probably uh, in a single season here. So that was kind of a, a surprise. This gold, these gold foliage Japanese maples need a little afternoon shade. The spot that this is in is getting some direct sun, maybe for two, three hours, and then it's in the, some late day shade. Uh, next up is this Bignonia that's growing on the fence. This one is called Jekyll, uh, Bignonia Jekyll, or Crossvine, uh, so, some people call these. Uh, Dr. Durr found this one 
uh, on Jekyll Island and it was a much brighter flower. It just stood out from the other uh, bignonias he had ever seen. I got this one as a clearance plant last year and it went up as a video and it was this high on this little stake and it's done this already this season, about three and a half feet of growth. This is a vine that can really kind of take off and really uh, get out of control pretty quick. So occasionally this thing's gonna need to be reined in. There will be uh, most of the bignonia here in the neighborhood that I saw bloomed maybe a month ago back in the first of May. And then they'll get some residual flowers on them here and there, but uh, usually the biggest flowering they're gonna do has already passed. We're filming this mid, almost mid-June. Uh, next up is a podocarpus called Mood Ring. This one's called Mood Ring because all the new growth on it goes through these shades of pink and uh, various colors on their way to green, which is pretty typical of podocarpus, although you'll see a white one uh, in, this in this video as well. Uh, very fast growing, very upright, narrow uh, conifer. I probably have it in a hair more shade uh, than it would like, so it's stretching on me a bit. I've already pruned it hard one time, and um, it is definitely much fuller than it was before, and it definitely has more of this color showing up in it. But it's a great plant. If you've got a narrow place to screen, and this was, you know, this just kind of called for something that was upright and narrow. There's some ajuga down under, under that. I'll move the uh, unstaked Japanese maple. There's some ajuga down here. Uh, there's a hosta that came from uh, Steph's dad, and she talked about that uh, in another video. What was that one? Royal Standard. It's Royal Standard. So, you know, it's struggling a bit under there. It needs to be watered, and it's not in a place where we would be watering it. Again, here's another container that's just kind of out of place right this minute being hidden uh, while, we, uh, while we construct the uh, patio back here. This holly is called Christmas Jewel. It is quite beautiful. It has a nar uh, very narrow leaf on it. It's been in this container for almost two years. It's probably ready to be somewhere else or be in a larger container. Very heavy fruiting. It had tons of berries on it there. In fact, a lot of them are still on it now and just have dried up, but heavy flowering, heavy fruiting, self-pollinating. So it, it had the berries all by itself. We're gonna find a home in the ground for this one sometime this year. This hydrangea is called Deer Dolores. It's a remontant one, meaning it'll bloom heavily like it is now and it will continue to get a few uh, flowers on it during the uh, rest of the growing season. It's in a little bit of a wilt. It's late afternoon. Pretty typical of these hydrangea macrophyllas that they would be in a little bit of a wilt here on an 80, you know, upper 80s kind of day. Uh, as soon as the sun goes down, you know, there's plenty of moisture here right this minute. It actually doesn't need water and it's been in the ground long enough that it doesn't need anything. As soon as the sun goes down, it'll kind of perk back up and be fine. The hosta underneath it here is called Dancing Queen. Definitely comes out a bit more uh, chartreuse than it is uh, at this point. I think, you know, back in the middle of April, it was just like lighting the whole place up. It's starting to fade back toward green just a little bit, which is pretty normal uh, here in the South for some of these. It's still super, super showy. Leaves are beautiful. I love the veins in this one, um, in, in the leaves. It's just so striking. It's in flower. A lot of our hosta that you'll see in this uh, series of videos are in flower, and we have a lot of hosta out here. Uh, there are several agapanthus uh, throughout the garden. Uh, this is a, uh, a white one. Uh, this one hasn't thrown up a flower spike yet. Uh, as long as we spring plant our agapanthus, you're going to see quite a few of them in the garden. Uh, they come back reliably for us. They're a little later blooming this year. That December freeze definitely put them to sleep very rudely. <laughs> and it's taken them a little while longer to get their engine going this spring, but now they are, and they're starting to uh, show off. There's a Camellia japonica right here that's one that uh, we found, um, identified uh, on a, another Camellia japonica in the neighborhood. It was a sport off the side of it. Uh, it's one that I hope uh, we will eventually release in some way or name uh, in some way. It won't ever get patented or anything like that. It's not that special, but it is unique to us, and it's a big, beautiful double pink flower. Up here above my head is the first of three Osmanthus fragrance uh, in this line uh, that we'll see. This one uh, took a little bit of damage there in December, but not a whole lot. It actually came right back out and was blooming uh, in February. Very fragrant flowers. Great screening plant. You can see you can't see through that thing at all, and that one's up about eight feet tall at this point. Uh, th there's a hardy begonia uh, planted here. This one's called Sterling Moon. 
I think it may be getting a little bit too much sun right here. Uh, the leaves are a bit crispy. Uh, it came up, it was, it was really looking very good. It's in full flower, uh, really, really looking good. The leaves, as it's, the temperatures have gotten up here in the middle 80s, the, the edges of the leaves have gotten a little bit crispy on it, so it may need to slide back in here a bit. Steph wants to move this Nandina Adafuku, which is a variegated, uh, a variegated Nandina. It's a really cool Nandina. It turns red in the winter time, just like Firepower Nandina does. Uh, but when it's green during the summer, it's variegated. Really cool plant, uh, not invasive in any way, shape or form. It does not flower, does not fruit, does not berry, uh, like um, other Nandinas that can be invasive. Really great plant. I think we're gonna slide this one somewhere else and slide this Sterling Moon back up in here just a bit, give it a little bit more protection. And, because, and the other reason we're moving the Nandina is because we have a couple of Encore Zellias back here that are being blocked by it. I have three different ones. There's Autumn Fire, which is a dwarf red, a, a true red uh, Encore Zellia. These have bloomed once already. They bloomed back in the spring. They were on a walk around tour back in late March probably. And then they're in the process of, I, we pruned them after that in a pruning video, and now they're flushing back out. They'll be blooming again in the fall. We've got Autumn Fire, Autumn Bonfire, and is it Autumn Lily here? Autumn Lily is a white one uh, that's right there. The uh, Laura Petalum up here above it, this is Carolina Midnight. It is out over this thing a little bit too much. This thing needs a little bit of control added to it. But this Laura Petalum is one of the absolute best. It's maybe top five most questioned plant on this channel is what is the purple plant behind you? What is the purple plant behind you? There's another couple of these in the garden that was always get a question no matter when. Uh, is this Carolina Midnight Laura Petalum? The purple is all the way through the plant and the flowers are almost red. It grows like a weed. It can grow six feet in just a few months and we've pretty consistently got to be pruning on it. We're not going to name all the annuals on the screen uh, as we go, the individual names. We just did these annual planting videos within the last couple months, so you can go back and get the exact names. Uh, but this is a combination of white impatiens, some red sorrel, polka dot plant, and some lobelia. And it is really loving that spot. It has been you know, white flowers, man, I think white flowers are frequently undervalued. That is so, that's a, such an incredibly showy little spot uh, in the garden, and you know, it gets. Uh, pretty good amount of sun there. The polka dot plant seems to be holding up to it uh, just fine. Uh, this uh, is one of the other most asked about plants in the garden. This is a St. John's wort called Brigadoon. Uh, that gold foliage is absolutely amazing. In the winter time, it has a bit of a little bit of an orangey hue to it. We mow this off in the late winter, literally with a lawnmower. We run a lawnmower through here and uh, cut, it, cut it down and it just flushes back out with all new foliage and just looks fantastic. Uh, it does get the little yellow, it gets the yellow flowers on it that we see on other St. John's warts, but not very many. Uh, the bees do love them when they do flower and the yellow flower really doesn't show up against that yellow foliage very, very well. But that combination, that Brigadoon, St. John's wart and this Carolina Midnight Laura Petalum up above it is again, uh, it's a winner uh, because if, if, if I can, if I, if I base it on the amount of attention it's gotten on the channel uh, since they went in. Uh, this is a distillium back here uh, called Bayou Bliss. It's a great, low, compact, uh, had a different name for a while, but uh, it, it's settled on Bayou Bliss. Uh, low growing, it's been in the ground for two years. That's as tall as it's been. Most of the uh, distillium can get you know, pretty gangly uh, over time. Extremely compact. Very good flowering distillium, gets red flowers along the stems in the early spring. It's in the same exact family as the Laura Petalum, so it's those little frilly, witch hazel type uh, flowers. Uh, there's a uh, Blatilla here, or a Chinese ground orchid. Uh, these bloomed a month or two ago, and then they continue to be interesting in the garden all season long. There's a toad lily in front of it, and it's a variegated toad lily and it's called Sunny Spirit is the name of it. Really striking plant. It's hit the ground running. I mean, it was, uh, that was just went in the ground this season and it's put on a ton of growth already. We're slowly making our way toward the east along the south side of the uh, property line here. Uh, this next hosta is called Hans 
What a dent. Well, look at this thing. Look how incredible this Hosta is. This is one of my favorites of our collection out here. And again, it's gonna be, you're gonna see a lot of them over the course of this video series. Another one that's in full flower at this point. So we're catching these in full flower. We're not catching everything in really full, you know, and we, the early spring things went off very early this year. And some of the summer things have been a little slow to get started. So, uh, but we are gonna see all the Hosta in full bloom. There's another Osmanthus fragrance up here again just big green thing but it happens to bloom with fragrant flowers in october november sometimes in december it gets to be the coldest part of the winter and it kind of stops and then it'll pick up and have a few more flowers in february early march sometimes this year all the way into april uh, continue to have at least a few flowers and we can smell it everywhere out here when they're in bloom Next is Sunshine Ligustrum. These can be kept kind of whatever size you want to keep them, hardy in zone six to 10. And uh, we're keeping this one as kind of a pyramidal shape. I need to prune it right now a little bit. I think it needs a, bit, a little bit of a haircut. Once they're in the ground for a while, they can really put on some growth in a single season. But you can keep this Sunshine Ligustrum as a little meatball about this big, or let it become a pretty tall, upright, narrow kind of shrub if you want to, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but really this this bright chartreuse color just shows up so well in the garden and you can see i think already that we use a lot of it mostly me it was mostly me everywhere i go i talk stuff into another variegated plant or another chartreuse colored plant there's some victoria blue salvia uh, right there that's in bloom it's definitely not getting enough sunlight and probably not getting enough water for its liking uh, either when it one of the things you know one of the things in gardening is uh this spot was plenty sunny enough and had plenty of space for it uh two years ago when the victoria blue salvia was originally planted here and we had some white here as well and now fast forward two years the sunshine ligustrum's gotten big the tree that's above it's gotten a little bit bigger there's a little more root competition over here other shrubs are crowding it and it's not getting the sunlight that it was getting and now it's not all that happy. I can stick a shovel under it, move it out into the sun, cut it in half, uh, and it'll come right back out from that and look fantastic. Uh, next up is a Chinese snowball viburnum or viburnum macrocephalum. Just tree formed this in a video recently. I've got this uh, steak. This is meant to be, you know, to grow cucumbers or something like that on in a vegetable garden, but it's absolutely perfect for staking a tree like this. Uh, it was just a shrubby thing, took all the bottom foliage off of it up to here, uh, tied it up straight. It'll stay tied up probably for a year and a half, and I'll have to move these, step, these ties occasionally. But it's going to be a tree, you know, a big tree up here above us. It'll end up 14 or 15 feet tall with a spread up at the top, but the bottom of it's just going to be single trunk, single trunk tree. Uh, one last thing uh, before we move just a bit. These dahlias back here are seedling dahlias. So we have hybrid dahlias that you're gonna see in these tour videos. And then we have a bunch that we actually did from seed here at the house and seed we've collected from our own dahlias. And this happens to be one of them. And it has, the flower on that is about, I would say four inches across. It starts as this darker flower like that and then it ends up with kind of a white striping in it. Bees absolutely love these. They've been, bees are on them constantly. We're shooting this about six o'clock and the bees have, most of the bees have gone home uh, at this point, but, or six in the evening, but what a great one. Uh, these are just absolutely fantastic. We're growing most of our uh, dahlias near the fence line and you'll see in a future video how many we actually have over there but by having them close to the fences this chain link fence we can just tie them right up against it don't have to add any additional staking out here uh, to take care of them if you follow the channel for any length of time you know i love this juliet clara one of my absolute favorite plants in the garden i have a lot of favorite plants uh, for sure but every time i examine this plant in any way it's just always so perfect uh, the variegation is so nice in it a uh, little, you know, it's a good screen. It's a, here for it to be a screening plant, but you can see its pace is a little bit slower than some of the other screening plants that we've seen along the line, because that's just true of variegated plants. They grow a little slower, but man, look at the every leaf. It's just so interesting on this plant. When the new growth is coming out, it'll have a bit of a pink or bronzy kind of hue to it, and then it settles in 
to this variegation. The variegation actually becomes stronger on some of the old leaves, which is a little different than some other plants that tend to go the other direction. But you see how, see how showy that is. Every leaf is different, but the variegation is very stable. I've never seen a green branch on that thing. So, uh, you know, incredibly stable. There's an anemone, a fall blooming anemone next to it. Uh, these can be garden bullies. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the, 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 we've got another one out by the road and you know they're, they're on their way. They're running through this mulch, running through these pathways. They've got to be cut out occasionally and you can easily just grab a piece right out of the ground and cut it off and go plant it somewhere else uh, easily. These will bloom in the fall. Some of our fall blooming things are blooming now so I've wondered if these were going to think about trying to bloom uh, as well. We don't know the uh, variety on this one. We had a neighbor uh, uh, that was moving to a new mountain home and uh, did, you know, called the other neighbors and asked if you wanted anything in her garden. And she had some beautiful things. So Steph went and put a few holes in her garden. <laughs> she didn't care. That was, that, was, that, that, was, that was part of it. The folks that were buying the house weren't that interested in the, uh, in, the, in the plants that were there. They were going to erase it. So uh, she, would, she made a deal with them to give the plants away. So that's the way that went. Uh, there's a ground orchid uh, back behind it, uh, and that's, that one's almost in storage. There was another one on the other end as well. We've got to get those out somewhere where they would be, uh, be happier. It's amazing they're, how drought tolerant those little orchids are, uh, honestly. We, we haven't watered them probably as much as they would have wanted. This osmanthus is really interesting where the osmanthus fragrance back here has uh, little white flowers on it. Uh, that are that are very very fragrant. This one's called Apricot Echo. They're actually orange flowers, and so the orange orange flowered version uh, of Osmanthus, very very fragrant. Uh, this one is in a little more shade than it wants to be in, but I'm about to talk about our shade possibly above this thing going away. We've got a problem with the red bud that's up above uh, Steph's head. It's been a little bit thin because it's stretching for light. We've cut it a couple times, and it's a little bit fuller than it was, but. Ultimately, I may have it in just too much shade. If it's not, if it's going to be thin like this and it's going to not flower like we want it to flower, it may need to go around uh, to the other side and be in a little bit more sun or some other location in the garden, wherever it is, uh, so that we can get more of the flowers. More the new growth on this one is burgundy, and uh, I'm not getting much of that either, just because of the uh, the shade that it's in. The Elys this is the second of many Elysium we will see in the garden. This is Gray Ghost, another uh, kind of a almost grayish foliage on that one. Uh, interesting pink flowering variety. That Miss Scarlet that we started the video with back there has red flowers. This one has pink. Uh, it looked really bad after the December freeze. It looked like it was the most damaged plant in the garden. It bloomed, then basically dropped every leaf, and now has flushed back out and hasn't missed a beat, really. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times these Elysium, as we put them in the ground out here, have all seemed kind of needy. They've needed some additional water early on, but once they've gotten their feet under them, gotten going, this thing's gotten no additional water from us uh, this year, really. There's some impatience planted under that. There's little spots of annuals everywhere throughout this garden you're going to see in all of these uh, tour videos we do plant our amaryllis in the ground this is several varieties that we got from color blends uh, they're perfectly fine over here in the ground that big giant amaryllis bulbs we'll have them we'll buy them have them in the house enjoy the flowering and then stick them in the ground and then they'll bloom in the ground uh, later on uh, but you know they're really again it's another thing that december freeze was pretty tough on these and they've been a little bit slow to come back but now i can see that they're starting to to get some momentum going they're starting to build some energy and uh, get started this bluish hosta here is called jet stream has a lighter coloration right in the middle of the leaf and then kind of a bluish uh, edge on it the this one has not we ha haven't seen oh there they come flowers are just starting to to spike up on this one uh, plant looks great. Uh, these blue hosta are always a pretty interesting. Most of these blue hosta will be pretty green here in the south by the end of summer. There's just a wax, waxy film on them that kind of burns off or kind of melts off during the season and they just get greener and greener. So this was very, very blue 
as you can tell from some of the leaves that haven't been quite as exposed to as much sun yet, the one that has has started to turn much greener. Literally the kind of a waxy film is melting off of it. The tree up above our head, this is the uh, native red bud. This is Circus canadensis. That December freeze did a number on this tree. We have, uh, I've done some pruning on it over the last three years, just kind of sculpted it and shaped it where it could stay right here uh, up against the house. But this limb I have my hand on is completely dead. There is, uh, there are cracks in the stem. I think, I'm pretty sure that what happened on this branch was back in December, it just was not prepared uh, for that freeze. It had just enough moisture up in it that, uh, you know, uh, that it killed this branch. It may have already been in a weakened condition or something like that. The other two, um, this main branch, uh, main part here has a little bit of dead up in it, but overall it's flushed out and it's doing okay. The other piece looks absolutely fine. But I'm gonna saw this one out. Maybe I'll leave it a little while longer because the hummingbird feeder hangs there and we can see it out of a window uh, from the kitchen. Hopefully not losing this tree. This tree is actually a big part of the, the landscape out here because one of the videos you're gonna see is all the plants that's up under it and all of those are shade loving plants. So it would really change our landscape drastically uh, to lose this native red bud. So we're gonna stop it right there. That was um, the screening plants on the south side, uh, you know, from one end to the other uh, over to this red bud. We'll pick it up right here and do the plants, the shade plants that are along the side of the porch and then eventually uh, out into the main area of the back garden. Thank you guys for following along with the video and the channel. And there's gonna be, again, there's gonna be a lot of videos to get this completely covered, but we wanted to go through and just show you how the things that we showed going in the ground have performed over the last couple of years.